Greetings, explorers. Welcome to a very special exploration with Michelle Gibson, one who needs no introduction in this field of research. Michelle, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I'm actually honored to be speaking with you. Uh, much of my research um, um, it is built upon your research. And uh, I also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your service to humanity. Uh, and I mean it in the most sincerest way. I think it's very important work, um, and it's it's uh, not easy work um, digging out the truth from beneath the lies. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> if, if you don't mind uh, giving us a brief synopsis of uh, your experience in this uh, field of research, and then we'll get into a conversation. I can do that. So. In terms of getting to where I am right now, where I'm sitting here talking to you on this subject, um, goes really back to the very beginning of my life in the sense that I became aware of things, anomalies in the environment from a young age and filed it away in my brain. And I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. in Rockville, Maryland, and uh, not too far from the CNO Canal and you know, a lot of history there, and I'm, I'm working on something right now that I'm pulling some things out, starting there as a starting point. And it's, it's like, long before I consciously became aware of any of this, I was collecting puzzle pieces. And I, I really believe that this is a life mission for me, because there's absolutely no reason for me to know any of this. I grew up in a uh, solidly middle class family, Southern Baptist background parents, and there was nothing. <laughs> There's still nothing. There's my parents are still alive, and you know this isn't even a, a blip on their sure. radar. I mean, it's <laughs> it's not sure. There. Yep. And so I was interested in mystery kind of programs when I was growing up. And there's certainly a lot more available now than there was in the, the 70s and the 80s. Um, but things like Unsolved Mysteries and In Search Of and programs like that, I just, I just loved. And, you know, again, I'm just kind of filing things away. It's still part of the, the Paul's story. But at least there's some kind of introduction of things that can't be explained. Yeah, yeah, just sort of seeping <laughs> into the uh, seeping into our consciousness very slowly, very right. at that time. And I appreciate shows like Ancient Aliens because at least it's getting those things out to the public. Because if it was called Ancient Humans, it would not have made it past. <laughs> <the first number laughs> <of episodes>. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the so they can talk about it if it's like somewhere out here and woo woo and the, things like that. But it's still getting something out to the public for consumption yeah. on, you know, otherwise um, forbidden topics. Yeah. And so, you know, the Internet's been an invaluable tool. Without it, we'd be sunk, I think. Yeah, I agree. But, <laughs> but it's been invaluable. And so I'm saying that because there's pre-internet post-internet and what you could find before that was things like chariots of the gods and you know stuff like that um but more information's become available i couldn't do most of the research i do without it i have gone to places i have taken pictures but since i'm going all over the earth you know there's places i've never even heard of that's right yeah and so um and i'll talk about that here in just a moment so bringing that forward in 20 so i started to see what's in the environment around me when i was living in oklahoma city and all the earthworks and megalithic stones all over the place just kind of along the sidewalk and starbucks and in front of starbucks and things like that and I had a Moorish American friend that introduced me to the Moors, and I didn't know anything about the Moors before that. And and so the, the pieces are starting to kind of come even faster because the Moors have been totally removed from history with the exception of 800 years in Spain. And their 
architecture and accomplishments, accomplishments, excuse me, have been credited to everyone else and anyone else. Even people with no background in anything get credit, architects and so on. They're just like geniuses. <laughs> no training. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All too often <laughs> hear that story. All too often. You know, so so they and and the um the usurp we'll call them the usurpers infiltrated the Masonic lodges. And so there was Moorish Masonry and then there's what we know as Western Freemasonry. And they don't have that knowledge. What they seem to be able to do is invert it, subvert it, use it for let's just say black magic, because that's what we're talking about. Sure. Um, sadly. And and so they've subverted it, sacred geometry, all nine yards, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Yeah. And used it against us to bind us and control us and suck the life out of us and the wealth out of us and leave us with crumbs and we think we're doing good and um that's how the system has been set up and rigged and Parasites. so <laughs> exactly so um so we think we're doing great you know with our nine to five and our little amenities and all our distractions and things like that um when the reality is is pretty pretty darn scary and I don't really like to go into the darker parts, but the roads lead there when you, you know, when you get deep into the rabbit hole and, and start putting the whole thing together. It's, yeah. it's pretty, pretty bad. What we really are to them, I suppose, is what you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Sure. Right. And energy source. We can source. leave it at that. Yeah, we can leave it. <laughs> we don't have to go too deep into that on, here on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, um, so my original research started when I found a star tetrahedron by connecting cities in North America. And, but that gave me, ended up giving me more data points. And so I wrote them down in spreadsheets and I started looking at these places in alignment. And by that time I had a background in sacred geometry from a Flower of Life course that I had taken in around 2007. And I, again, with the information that's coming in on the internet, uh, conferences, megalithomania was a big influence when I first started. Yeah. Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods, Robert Bobal and the Orion mystery or theory or something with the belt stars of Orion and the pyramids of Giza. I, I like to jump um, in, I, I'd say our experiences overlap very very nicely and as far as that research goes i got deep into that stuff even drum Vallow's research is that mm -hmm. that's who you're referring yeah. to right drum Vallow was where i learned about sacred geometry yeah so we're sinking and that was that was around 2007 mm -hmm. and and so i started getting this alternate stream in and you know when i say it feels like a mission to me it's like the things i'm interested in are is this alternative research and history and and people and books and experiences started just to come my way i mean i didn't even have to go look for it i uh, i had a friend i was living in fairbanks alaska at the time and i had a friend who got the the books from the president of the university of alaska as he was retiring yeah. and 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 some of these books were in that collection and you know, I happened to be visiting and looking at the books that she got from him, and I'm like, oh, I'll take this one, and I'll take this one, and I, you know, and I think, you know, I think Balval's book was in there, and there was some some other Atlantis Rising kind of things in there, and and I'm reading this, I'm like, oh, this is gonna add more and more, yeah, and and so, but it's not just the books; it's it's people and it's experiences, and yeah. And then I had the skill sets to do to put it all together. And I have to say, I've always been a, a good technical writer. And I liked to write poetry when I was a kid, but all of my writing outside of my education, I had nothing to write about. You know, it's like, I'm yeah. not going to sit here and write about my life. I'm not going to do all this other stuff. But when this came into focus for me, it's like, I have so many topics and things to write about that I could go on forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, so 
extensive body of work on your website definitely <laughs> yeah and it and it's like when i got the got all this information and it came together for me it's like okay i have this responsibility to get this back out um, because i really feel like i got the big picture and as I've been yeah. doing the research of following these places in alignment, that was the beginning of my research. Um, I started to see everything looking the same all over the earth and how the colonizers came in, where they went. They, they seemed to be following these ley lines, grid lines, um, you know, capturing star forts at the uh, very when beginning. When are you piecing this together? What, 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 when are you piecing all this together, what you're talking about now? between so when i started blog so i got the the star tetrahedron in north america I extended the lines out i wrote down the places um i was already seeing the megaliths in the environment and the earthworks and starting to look differently okay. at buildings and you said that yep. you look a lot at the architecture i started looking differently at buildings um i learned about the moors and and so when i started doing the blogging my early posts which I soon converted into videos so everything I write about is in video form also yeah. I, I I talked about that you know like the salt lakes and connecting dots and you know how I came into this awareness what are star, star forts and then when I started following cities and places in alignment I got even more information that um you know, I could see the same hand of design all over the earth. You know, all the infrastructure was the same. The snaky S-shaped rivers, the canals, the um, the buildings. The, um, you know, there's just yeah. so many things to choose from. And yeah. so um, I, I got to that point. And then when I started looking at those places, I started to get into all this data about the original civilization and how wonderful it was. And and then I started to see who the colonizers were and when they were coming in and going deep into that. So I've ended up doing a lot of timeline research, which we're gonna be talking about. And um, it's, it's just taking me deeper and deeper into this. And I really believe that it's a co-creative process with whatever is helping me along in this and and i do believe that I, i'm not doing this by myself um no. you know I'm, I'm open to the idea that i got help from the other side <laughs> sure this, this thing oh we got a live one <laughs> well <Here>. I, your, <laughs> your research has really is put a call out to to those of us out there who seek truth as well that's why i'm here talking to you now so you know it's a uh, looking for cavalry the cavalry's coming in now i think you're starting to see this research um swell I, I i think anyway despite any sort of censorship that might be out there and what's really interesting about it is it's it's, it's bubbling up from the, the grassroots if you will um because the cavalry that you're talking about um there was cavalry in place before i started and yeah. and that the numbers are growing of people just looking at things and you know registering hey wait a minute there's something really wrong here mm -hmm. and and we're not big names <laughs> <laughs> you are you come know? on michelle uh, oh, you're, okay. you're a legend but i'm not you're a legend. <laughs> <laughs> really i'm not <laughs> no i hear, i know what you're saying <laughs> well, because they've so the pop culture has been you know we know what pop culture is so yeah, so, so basically un unknowns you know in the in the the world of yeah. um of influencers if you if you will and and so um you know i'm just doing what i'm motivated to do yeah period yeah. because i feel like i have a responsibility to do it and i do enjoy it yeah. and sometimes my head just swells and wants to burst with the things <laughs> that i'm finding and i you know it, it doesn't always feel very good um but you know, we have to keep breaking that down so that people do start asking questions. And that's the biggest thing I try to message I try to leave with people is just start looking in your own community. It's there. Yeah. It's yeah. all over the earth. Yeah. For for the buildings that are still standing. And you know, you're showing pictures of buildings that aren't. 
Is that one in Atlantic City? Yeah, that's the Marble Marble you know, Blenheim, that, I believe. That burned burned down, I believe, or was demolished or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not there anymore. <laughs> no, it's gone. <laughs> Of course. There's a lot of it. There's a, there was a lot of Moorish architecture and yeah. there. It's, yeah. So anyway, I recognize. Well, I, I'll I'll explain like my experience with this research is like, like I got deep into it two years ago. After a couple decades of alternative research, this hit me from the left field like a ton of bricks. Um, like how could I have missed this? Uh, was my reaction and I was in a state of shock for several months trying to understand what I was looking at. Um, it took me a while to really level off my feelings about it all and be able to articulate it and then I, a year later I began to share on YouTube but uh, this is takes a bit of digestion this field of research for people you know yeah. you know and same thing and I think we're all in that boat of how did I miss this because yeah. I'll, I'll be 60 in July and even though I've started to notice things when I was younger like really yeah. young I didn't see it until the last let's say last 15 years I didn't and see maybe it maybe that maybe this gets into the whole veil thing that you, you talk about piercing the veil of illusion the veil had to lift a certain amount for for more eyes to to actually see what uh what what this is deceptions all about because this deception's not that deep in time <laughs> we talked no, about this no. before we and, uh, we'll, and we'll get into that um, and it's it's a part of the field of research a lot of people have trouble with is um, digging into uh, a period of time where people that are alive may still be able to remember um, but the deception goes on down through right right to, right to modern day to be honest Right. And, and not only that, but even with people that are awake and aware to this, the dissonance involved with our history having been fabricated, uh -huh. anything in the historical narrative, as far as I'm concerned, at least before a certain point in time, is BS. Uh -huh. it, it's filler. And wow. maybe some of the historical characters lived and maybe they didn't, but it's been um, fabricated. And so I'm, I'm just going to finish the thought that, yep. so what I think is that at some point, and I, I don't know what year, the history that we're taught is history with them written into it, the uh, controller. Yeah. But before that point in time, it's not. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking somewhere in the 1700s, maybe 1800s, it would be around that time. Uh -huh. But like we were talking about before you started to record, there are photos in existence of mud flood in the early 1900s in places like Pittsburgh. Yeah. And so it just really, um, you know, we can do a good job of at least presenting what's available to find and our ideas about it. But there's a whole black hole in there of, okay, what yeah and and it's it's interesting because um because i know so much is you know up to this day of what we're told is just completely false you know like false flags and you know all the things that have been done to get us into the state of constant fear yeah uh so that we're more easy to control well, was, um yeah i know i know that but i'm not up to speed on a lot of stuff so i'll look at the narrative i'll look at what the narrative says i'm not an expert in what's been hidden from us in terms of okay this was you know this person really didn't exist or you know this person is the same as that person or whatever uh -huh. and, and people will leave comments that that's not true or you know it, it you know anyway i'm just i'm just but i'm going with what's available to find yeah which is what they tell us and then I try to read between the lines or show patterns of things that are happening. And and that's what I'm able to do is show the patterns. And um, But I'm like everybody else. If I go to look something up, I'm going to find what the official story is. Yeah, we can't say one way or the other as far as what happened in a period of time or a place that we didn't, we weren't, 
there. So a lot of people come to defend the historical narrative because you're offending their sensibilities with the suggestion that maybe there's a deception. I've countered that a or, lot. Or the other way. Or the it other way. It goes both ways. For sure. Yeah. Either it's offensive to the sensibilities, you know, that, you know, it's too hard to believe that th that couldn't be true. Uh -huh. Or the people that are already red pilled or black pilled or whatever you want to call it that say, well, you're, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> that's not true either. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, go, I hear what you said. Black pill <laughs> is a good term. I deal with so, a lot of the black pill. <laughs> so I'm just trying to put together, okay, this this is what happened. But again, I'm looking for patterns. And that's at least as far as the, the narrative research and the timeline research. I, um, I, wanted, I, I wanted to mention, because you talked about how the, the, the way that our history has been recorded. We use a lot of newspaper articles to record history. Um, what the events of the last three years has really blown that wide open how much we are being lied to. Right. I think that that's why we're in such a trigger moment because it's now been made obvious to us how badly we've been deceived or how, and then we can now trace that back down through history and say, I don't trust it. I don't trust it. No, that's, right. yeah. And they're not even hiding it. They're, no. they're in accelerated mode. They've got to bring in their, their plans that they worked so long and so hard for but they could only really succeed if it was in darkness and it's all being exposed and um, yeah. And then the gaslighting and the lies that, yeah. they're, they told, that they tell and the inaction, you know, with a lot of yeah. the things that have happened this year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with all the explosions and all that kind of stuff. So, so they just double down even more on the lies and um, I saw a good quote too that said, uh, um, "The harder they push for their, the harder the darkness pushes now, the, the quicker the veil will lift." So it feels like we're in some sort of weird stasis. Like they they know this, they hesitate to push because the bat the the boomerang reaction becomes quicker and harder. You know, if right. that makes any sense. And I can tell you that if they were still in control we would still be in the mode that we were in three years ago. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. So that's so as, as, even though I want even though I want to see action, more action, I, I also know that it would be a far different situation. And um, yeah, I, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a part of what was planned playing out. But yeah, but, I agree with you. I think we're, we're, we're we resonate quite a bit with the, with our perspective. So um, do you want to uh, maybe go through a little chronology? We talked a little bit about, uh, like, I have a few websites open here. I, w I wanted to chart back from the 50s down to about 1900, because much of what I'm showing here um, comes from about that time period, 1900. Um, much of what I show on my channel um, are visuals from, let's say, 1880 to 1910, 1920. Um, okay. So, so I wanted... Go ahead. Go ahead and start with yours, and then I'll I'll uh, talk about the timelines, scenarios sure. that I put together. Okay, so um, like I said, so my, my channel mostly has to do with architecture, um, and we have what what's called the most of most of the architecture coming out of 1800 to about 1950, um, much of it destroyed over that time period, but we have the birth of what's called brutalism in the 50s, brutalist architecture. So, and that's the cityscapes that you see these days with the cubes, and very basic. There's no decoration, no architecture. Um, so I think that was really when they began building, uh, uh, rebuilding um, the, the world in their image, I suppose, which is a pretty ugly image. Um, so I wanted to chart backwards from that time period and illustrate possibly the way that they have engineered our timeline from, from about 1958 um, and moving backwards. And I was going to start with the uh, with the um, the founding of NASA in 1958, which I think is uh, helping to um, implant a perception of our reality. Let's leave it at that, I suppose. Um, and you have this incident as well at the during that same timeline or t same year, um, which I think is interesting and, and blends nicely with the, what's gone on over the last couple of years. 
Um, and then I do have a bit of a timeline before I get to a couple of the websites that I have uh, saved for us to go through. Um, atomic bomb testing in the 50s is worth a mention. Um, implementation of fear in the school system. Um, fear that it could all end at the flip of a switch. I think is, uh, is a major part of the trauma that they needed to inflict on us to for this to work. Uh, we can go back to um, post-World War II, United Nations, um, and of course uh, I didn't mention the TV, I wanted to bring up the implementation of the television. I hope I'm not jumping around too much here. I have a lot of information I wanted to get to with you. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the television, if you don't mind. Um, what do I have here? Oh, I thought I had it saved. Let's, uh, we'll get to it here. Are you familiar with John Logie Baird? That name? The name's not familiar. Okay. Let me just uh, open up a link. So this is apparently is uh, the, I don't know, the father, godfather of television. Um, it's not loading for me right now, but it's, it's just an interesting little blurb I wanted to bring up because television really taking hold in the 50s, late 40s, 50s in uh, like right now we're kind of focusing on North America, right? But uh, I don't know why this isn't loading. I'll just I'll just say a few things that I, I noticed about this gentleman. Um, he was into the channeling of spirits. Um, and that's sort of how the TV, the invention of the TV came about, um, which I thought was interesting because post-World War II, um, they really sit us down in front of the TV and uh, the programming goes into overdrive. So I felt that important to mention. And I do bring it up quite a bit in my videos as well. And I wish I had that on here. So spirit channeling television, there's a link there. Uh, what else? And then, of course, uh, World War II, which I think is the, is a major traumatic trigger event. I call it the hammer. That's when they really, really put the hammer down on Western society. And uh, there's a, there's an old saying with with uh, World War II: you don't talk about the war. Anyone who kind of came up through the through the 40s and 50s is that was sort of common knowledge. You just don't talk about the war. That's one way to erase history. Um, so I think that's important. And of course, Hollywood in conjunction. Um, with the wartime propaganda, um, mm -hmm. the setting of the narrative for our time. Right? Let's see here. I have the Dust Bowl on my list as well. The Great Depression and the Dust Bowl in the States. What do you know about uh, that period of time, if you don't mind sharing a little bit on that? Well, what's interesting is that in terms of architecture, a lot of the monumental architecture in, at least in the States and probably in other, I know it's in other places too, yeah. was attributed to depression era building programs. We're talking Greco-Roman style on steroids, Supreme like, Court building. Is um, that the Civil Works program? There's a few names and acronyms it, for that, right? Right, um, Public Works Administration, uh, the CCC and the WPA uh, tended to be smaller projects, um, like at parks and you know getting the areas to where people could come and visit with trails and picnic areas and things like that. But what I found is that these sites are old sites; they're ancient sites, and so you know confusing the public about who actually built them. Mm -hmm. so this this place was built by the CCC in the 1930s. But there's still stonework and you know impossible structures for unskilled laborers, <laughs> things like that. Uh -huh. um, and that was early in my waking up to this. I was going to a couple of those places and saying, hmm. yeah. and looking and taking pictures and seeing the facilities, and then also seeing beautiful stonework along canals and waterfalls and things like that so and, and old right old looking very old looking not less and, than 100 years old 
yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> a cover story, for sure. Yeah. Um, but there were larger uh, projects during the Depression, buildings, beautiful, incredible buildings that were said to have been built by these programs, and it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> no way. Yeah, I've seen quite a few in my research as well. And I, I, I include them in a lot of my videos. Um, and yeah, a lot of them have that Art Deco look, maybe. They have a lot of statue and ornate uh, and amazing interiors still. Right, and they have a whole um, bag of names that they call those styles, like you mentioned Art yeah. Deco, and you know, I've, <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. seen all kinds. Yeah. And Streamline, Stream, Streamline Modern is one. Yeah. And the other aspect, since you mentioned the Dust Bowl, is books like The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck about the Dust Bowl, which is what most people think about it. And these writers, Steinbeck and uh, especially Jack London, are influencers in the narrative. Mark Twain. Well, initiated. You know, they're, they're the... They're programming devices. All the stuff that we learn about you know, required reading in school um, that get turned into movies. So you ha you read this crap, if you will, when you're you know you're made to read it because it's compulsory education. Yeah. In the states, it was set up by the Rockefellers. They were involved in it from the, the get go uh -huh. in the 18, 1850s. Yeah. And and so um, they're they're feeding us this crap, and then. I mean, it's 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 hard because the whole system is based on lies. Everything is based on lies. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so we're taught this like it's gospel truth. And and so to really get to the truth, you just have to step back from everything you've ever learned. And yeah. for whatever reason, it was easy for me to do that. But it's not easy for most people. They're, they're expecting us to have trust and faith in, the, in their deception, right? That's what it appears to me. And once you take, once you... Once you don't, once you stop giving them that trust and faith, then you can really get into uh, and, uh, picking it apart, at least. You know. you know, I didn't get the memo about don't think critically, and that was deliberately removed from the curriculum around that same 1850 time period. Yeah. You know, so they took critical thinking right on out because they just wanted people educated enough to be able to work. <laughs> yeah. And there Obediently. Seems, <laughs> there seems to be enough research out there where it should be common knowledge that these robber baron type figures and you mentioned the Rockefellers, it should be obvious, Carnegie and all that crap. It just seems like it should be common knowledge, but it doesn't enter the, the pop culture. So pe anyone who puts all their faith in the pop culture refuses to accept it and see it. But it really is obvious with just a little bit of looking, peeking behind the veil, I think. Yeah. You know, and, and you mentioned with the television programming, starting after in earnest after World War II, you have that whole older generation that's been raised on all of this stuff. That's right. And, you know, my parents are in their 80s, you know, from you just believe what you're told on the TV and and you read the paper every morning or evening or whatever. You read the paper every day. I was yeah. never interested in the newspaper. <laughs> I didn't get that memo either. Allah, and that that ties right back into what I said, just said. Where, where does that lead you? Well, we've seen where that leads you in the last several years. So, again, we need to take our trust away from these institutions, and we will look at some of the founding of those anchors. I would say of, of conventional mainstream thought. In this, uh, I'm going to we're going to go backwards from 1929 to 1901, I believe. And then I want you to chime in with whatever you got on any of these incidents. So we're starting in 1929. I'll just read out some of it. Uh, interesting. So, um, the last year of the 20s, Richard Bird flies over the South Pole. You see a lot of this going on. North Pole, South Pole exploration and in, during this time period. I believe a setting of the narrative um, from my perspective. Um, the car radio was invented in 1929. Well, that helps get the, get the propaganda out there. Academy Awards made their debut. Then we have a few other things of St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and then of course the stock market crash, which triggers the Great Depression. Of course, I'm not saying we can trust any of these as having happened as they did either, to be honest with you, but this is how our chronology has, is given to us down through time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting. And you'll see as we as we move backwards here, 
um, the set really the setting of the narrative. 1928 and 28, we have sliced bread and bubblegum. Uh, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon. Well, what do you know? And there's penicillin. Right. <laughs> You know, and like we were talking about, it's like they just dress it up in benevolence. You know, Mickey Mouse and the whole yeah. <laughs> Disney, you know, phenomena is which uh, it's, it's been towards... exposed. It's it's out in the open. They're done. As far as I'm concerned, Disney is in trouble. There's too many people that can see. <laughs> That's what I think. They're, like I said, they're not hiding it anymore. So <laughs> you have to, you <laughs> they're have no to longer hiding it. <laughs> we're we're doing. in an age where you have to willingly accept. What so you can't turn I, I away won't, from that. <laughs> I won't go into detail, but I think it was either this morning or yesterday there was something about a shop at Disneyland um, that had a person in a dress with a mustache. I saw it. Too. <laughs> so. You have to accept it. You have to be okay with it all. <laughs> yeah. Ain't going to work. No. Exactly. I think it's, like I said, the harder they push, the quicker the veil lifts. So let's lift this veil already. <laughs> 27. 1927. You have the Babe Ruth narrative. And you've, you've, I like your work on uh, um, the energy grid and, and sports and how that's been set up for us uh, as like a, um, like a, and then hopefully, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like as a way to channel our energy, to harvest our energy. Right. And, and so I did quite a bit of work on Circuit Board Earth and really looking at terms and the patterns that I was seeing with airports and some kind of track, like in an angular relationship, a short yes. distance away all over the earth uh -huh. and um, sports stadiums being close to like rivers in the same configuration in different places. And then with the research that I had already done on hot springs and uh, trolley parks and you know these things that don't exist anymore trolley car systems um how they were taken out you know and those are other impossible stories like they did all this work to build this streetcar and then seven years later it stopped running yeah. um you know it gets pretty obvious um and i'm going deeper into things like that but um chad williams of deeper conversations with chad i highly recommend his work okay he took the whole circuit for Earth concept to another level with the stadiums and, and how it, it kind of forms our energy. We're being used like batteries, you know, yeah. essentially. And this is energy it? is being harvested and, uh, and we're doing some more work on stuff like that. So that's kind of a collaborative effort of just, you know, pinging off each other and, uh, another gentleman who's a, like a grid specialist, uh, yeah. Adam Sokolka, Sokolka. Okay. Um, and so anyway, we're kind of working together and really on, on some aspects of it, the energy harvesting and then doing our own, you know, work that we're guided to do. So, you know, it's like, and talking about it bubbling up from the grassroots, there's a lot of synchronistic kinds of things going on. And I just really think the information just wants to come back out. Is Chad okay. the one who uh, has analyzed the layout of the players in a lot of these sports and then, uh, as a diagram? I, that... I believe so, yeah. He's done quite a bit of work with I've that. Seen and that was this work. very interesting what, stuff. What he was, you know, how we, he has been guided yeah, in his sure. insights and intuition. Resonates. Um, sure. So, you know, it just seems like. <laughs> anyway, it's it's an exciting time. Um, absolutely, absolutely. It's yeah. it, it's really coming out faster than I can even keep my head. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good though. We need it. We need it. We need it to move. We need it to move. <laughs> we also have the BBC founding in 1927. BBC, we love the BBC, don't we? Okay. <laughs> uh, 1926. I'll, I'll try to pull. Henry Ford announced the 40 hour work week, 1926. How do you like them apples? Hey, we're doing good. We went from <laughs> every day, all day to 
40 hours yeah. on a weekend. <laughs> we should we should be grateful to Henry Ford for announcing the uh, 40 hour week, work week. I should actually throw this in there too. Here's the Ford logo with your what looks to be a couple of I don't know sixes maybe, possibly maybe I'm seeing things. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else? Do, Richard Bird again, Admiral Bird. Um, North Pole this time, South Pole, North Pole. So establishing, uh, yeah, the shape. We won't get too much into that. I know, I know, I have an idea of where you stand on, on the shape of well, where we exist. Well, I, I didn't have an opinion, but I've found enough evidence for the tampering of our perception of space and time that sure. even though I don't um, really focus on, on flat Earth, I, either we're on a spinning ball or everything is moving around us and I'm leaning towards everything's spinning around us. Yeah, that seems to be. And, and there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a third option there, isn't there? A tor toroidal shape a tor that a lot of people... And I'm, I'm, I'm actually comfortable with that. Um, yeah. But what we've been told is... Let's just say what we've been told is hogwash and, and uh, we can explore other options. We're into exploring other options. Right. Uh, okay, Houdini dies. Um, let's see what else here. Oh, the, this is a good one. Um, first liquid fueled rocket it's fired off, 26. Um, Route 66 is established in the States, which I thought was interesting. 226. And then you have your Winnie the Pooh for generations of children to adore. All right, 1925. They get into the, the dress of the time, um, and then Hitler. It's funny how he just seems to be, you know, all down through the decades previous to World War II. He pops up in a lot of these, uh, a lot of this type of research. And what's also interesting is that in between World War One and World War Two, in the in Weimar Germany they were doing the exact same kind of social experimentation that we're seeing now, you know, now they were, yeah. it was the exact same. And, and the people of Berlin, for example, they, they, they were poor, you know, the economy was tanked. Um, they only had, you know, a few options. And so they were a lot of, you know, prostituting and these, you know, bars and speakeasies would offer free booze and, you know, and then they got into the whole um, Victor Victoria kind of thing. Yeah. As a, as a cultural event during that time. So, you know, it seems like what I'm, what I'm seeing in my history, history research are practice runs. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> lots and lots of practice runs. Yeah. Um, so, so before the partition of India, in 1947, after the end of World War II, where they they send the Hindus in one direction and the Muslims in the other direction, uh -huh. and just rip them up, they did the same thing in around 1905 in what was Bengal, but in Bangladesh, uh -huh. um, they they did it on a smaller scale, mm. and and so it just it just seems like okay before they do this. <laughs> they're gonna test run it sure of course yeah on the smaller scale and then uh, the, before you release it on a larger scale sure yeah you know and the whole thing with um this the name that we're not going to mention you know you, you mentioned the the whole polio thing uh -huh. and, you know just kind of getting us used to that whole concept of course yeah science and just you know increasing numbers and schedules and you know by a certain age you have so many um that are required um yeah. you know so they're they're introducing us to the idea of these ideas slowly and, and it's it requires a blind faith and that's that's exactly what's in question right now is hold on a sec we had all our faith in this and we're starting to realize maybe we shouldn't have, you know mm -hmm. okay uh, Great Gatsby also comes out in 1925, and that's interesting too because the great I don't I may have read it, I may have seen a movie, but it doesn't have to do with sort of uh, uh, forget your worries and party uh, extravagance. Am I, am I, 
that's kind of what the gas great Gatsby's about, right? Probably. I mean, they were, you know, nar- setting the narrative. Yeah, yeah. I found it interesting because this website really lays out the setting of the narrative, so that's why I wanted to share it. That's interesting. Olympic first Olympic Winter Games, nineteen twenty four. Um, there's an energy harvesting going on there every couple of years. You can really feel the build up to any of these Olympic Games. I think. And there's there's some bizarre statues outside of I believe it was the Olympic Stadium in Los Angeles. There's two bodies, one male, one female, with no head. Oh, that's fantastic. So they're like these, you know, muscular specimens yeah. with no head. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And and there's you know there's a lot of really um, disturbing public art. Yes. You know that that gets stuck out there. People walk around it. Um, they're interacting with it, but they don't protest. Yeah. Oh well, that's you know, somebody just put that ugly piece of art there. And yeah. you know, again, that's a, that's another part of the the programming and I think gaining of our consent um, for this anti-human agenda. Yeah, is, I see it all. Well, they they you know they don't showed don't you complain. I showed you, and you were fine <laughs> with it. Yeah, that's why we have to complain. It's very important for us to speak out against it. I think it. Uh, to protest and, and say we know we're not okay with this and that's I think what we do with our research as well I think and it's happening on a large scale I think in our society you know and, and sometimes I definitely have an opinion that I'm trying to get across mm-hmm. and a lot of times I just want to put the information out there so people can see it and come to their yeah. own conclusions of course of course and you do a great job of that by the way <laughs> thank you so I do it. I do it both, but but I really want people to think about it. Sure, I think it's important. Definitely. Here we have Time Magazine, founded 1923. One of the anchors of modern thought, I suppose. One of what do you have? Newsweek, Time, The Economist. All of those have shaped um, the thinking man and woman's perception for quite some time. I think. And I, I like your choice of the word anchor because that's what we call newscasters, right? Oh, yeah, right. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can anchor your beliefs with those those individuals, right? <laughs> Just trust us. Just trust. Yeah. I like this one. This one kind of struck a nerve with me as I was looking at it yesterday. Um, the tomb of King Tut discovered in, by this gentleman. I should. I'm not sure if his name's in there. It feels fake to me. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I came across it yesterday. It feels like a setting of a narrative and a timeline. That's what it feels like to me. Could be wrong. We have uh, also in 22, Mussolini marches on Rome, 30,000 men, fascists come to power in Italy. So we really have turmoil going on everywhere. You don't have like a, a settled people any of the re- these regions you know an upheaval bottom line question everything absolutely absolutely yeah what else do we have here we have the um, air travel narrative being cemented in our reality here in 1921 um, interesting I'll keep going Women win the right to vote, 1920. Uh, the first commercial radio broadcast airs. A League of Nations is established. <laughs> Amazing. And the Harlem Renaissance began. I don't know exactly what that is. but So this is interesting. Like the setting of the narrative, really, really visible in, these, in this uh, timeline, I think. Prohibition as well. Let's not forget. I'm sure you have something to say about that. Rockefeller backed. Well, what I would have to say about that, Chris, is the whole role of alcohol that's been foisted on us to lower our consciousness and, you know, kind of put us out to where we don't care um, and, and making it a part of our culture so that, hey, it's fun to go to a restaurant with friends and have a few beers and, and whatnot. But, um, the point that I want to make 
is it's like controlled opposition. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about timelines here in the 1800s. It was really around 1830 um, that the new, the reset really kicked into high gear. Okay. And I, I, I look at 1850 as, as like the official beginning of it. 1850, 1851 with the Crystal Palace exhibition in London mm -hmm. as like, we're ready. This is what we did. And they, you know, we built this beautiful structure. Roll up and, the red carpet. Uh, <laughs> you know, literally yep. um, opened by yep. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and, you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. big, big goings on. Yep. And 1830, you start to see um, Scotch whiskey with teachers in Scotland. Oh. Um, and they had dram shops where <laughs> you could just go in and drink whiskey. Uh, and other beer and spirits distilleries really kicking up into high gear starting around 1830. And, you know, all these cities that I've looked at, uh, New Orleans and Cincinnati and St. Louis and all these places, early in their history had all of these distilleries and, and breweries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they want to get us snookered. Of course. And, um, and then you get into the whole orphan thing, which is a whole nother issue about why were all these orphans? <laughs> yeah. Where did they come from? Yeah. But if there were adults around, they were probably drunk. And then it was like the fault of the parents for their weakness in drinking. Uh -huh. And then you get into the whole temperance movement, and um, which looks like it was based on masonry because you see the same, the steps with the steps of Freemasonry you see with temperance, yeah, the drunk the drunkard's journey. Um, so you're making all of this alcohol available. Mm -hmm. People are drinking it; it's their fault, their vice, um, and then in the 1920s during prohibition oh we're going to take it away from you <laughs> oh. um you know but it's definitely part of how our collective consciousness was lowered that was deliberately imposed on mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. and um yeah you've got some great pictures there yeah keep going yeah it's the uh the, also, the prohibition acts as a way, like I, I have a saying that rings on my head sometimes, deprivation breeds an obsession. So what what they actually mm -hmm. did through prohibition appears to be they put it underground. They, they, they blew up the organized crime element of it, I suppose, and made it, you know, desirably in a, you know, in a hidden way, I guess. So. And I guess the other thing they did was, um, of course, there's tunnel systems everywhere, mm -hmm. but in in places they said, well, the tunnels were <laughs> constructed during prohibition so the gangsters could have some place to go. I've also heard that the tunnels were constructed for keeping the beer cool. That was, that's been <laughs> used a lot as well. So you got to love it. <laughs> yeah. They've certainly put a lot of effort into it. No doubt about that. So there's some breweries. I did a couple, I did do a video on breweries and it's uh. I like. I just like to compile the images and throw them out there for everyone to see, and just as like a catalog, really. And uh, it is a really interesting part of our uh, our reality. And, and right up into the modern day, it's it's a if you refuse a drink in a social setting, it's many people are insulted by that actually, which is I find interesting. And there's a whole other aspect to it when you look at how they've gotten so wealthy, and that we're paying for it. We're paying for our poisons, yes. No matter what it is, and we're paying for our mind control every time we go to the movies. <laughs> That's right. That's true. You will you love know, it. And there's that... something around organized sports. There's you know stuff going on with that. Sure. You know yeah. the balls. The balls for the different sports are connected to sacred geometry and sacred imagery. Yeah. You know, so it's like um, you know they completely rigged the system. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way they're going to get away with this, but they've been robbing us blind forever. <laughs> it, and it's a ruse because it's not a, not only have they imposed it upon us, they've they've made us beg for it in, right. in a way, right? Yeah. Yep. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. If you get down into the 19 teens. We have this gentleman again popping up with his workers' party. Um, a 
and then the Treaty of Versailles as a result of World War One, I, I believe. So alliances being made that uh, globalism, right, which we're we're facing the culmination of uh, in the modern day right now, and you see you can see the stepping stones being laid here as we go down backwards through time. It seems um, we have the Russian Tsar um, being killed. Um, and the family, of course, and then, then, of course, the Russian Revolution. So, the, the sectioning off of the realm, you know, the the beginning of the Cold War or the early stages of what will become the Cold War after World War II. Um, but so, I see this as a way of, for them to isolate us and do their do their work behind closed doors. You know what I mean? So we didn't really have contact with with this part of the world or China, the Chinese Communist Revolution. Same thing. Right. You know, and what I was saying before about practice, um, you know, bringing in communism to those places and what that really meant, you know, with their long-term agenda of bringing it in everywhere, you know, and how, you know, people were forced onto farms and millions died from famine because the system just didn't work. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the, the, the horrible reality of what has been planned for humanity was on full display. Yeah. And, um, you know, and again, you get into Freemasonry and Marx, I believe, was a Freemason. Mm -hmm. You know, all these people were Western Freemasons. Western educated. They're all Western and, and, educated. And so, um, I mean, for me, Zionism is not just the whole you know, Israel thing. I think I think it's a collective name for these individual beings, whatever they are. Sure. Um, that that there are different categories of people that fall in you know different parts of the world and not all one one religion, mm -hmm. but that have this this global dom domination plan, mm -hmm. an agenda that they want to implement, with the end result of us being completely. The ones that survive being yeah. completely controlled or controllable yeah. and and you know basically stealing our dna and our soul yeah the, <laughs> the, the, the trans transhumanist agenda right <laughs> right you know that's the end game for them but like like we said we would totally renounce it and uh, the harder they push the uh, the more it falls through their fingers that's how I mean, I you will it. you will have nothing you will be happy and you'll eat bugs <laughs> yeah so you can see here that would be the erasing of a culture, right? This is what they did. They erased the. This is where some of my roots come from. This old Russia, and, uh, and my mother came. My mother's grandfather came over from Russia in 1918 to uh, Chicago, I believe it was. Um, fled the, the, the revolution there. So uh, I'm closely tied with with uh, with um, that scourge on humanity, and I can I recognize it for what it is in the modern day here, and I, I completely renounce it. We don't need it. And, and what it seeks to do is erase culture, erase who and what we are. Yeah. Erase us. <laughs> erase the humanity as we know it. Not going to happen. Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's keep going back. Uh, let's see here. There's a few other interesting tidbits that come up at this period of time. So this is the beginning of the Russian Revolution here in 1917. Um, Congress in the States declares war on Germany. Uh, that has to do with the sinking of the Lusitania, I believe. Am I correct? And that's what got the States into World War One. we're told. Something like that. Um, now, the steamships, it was a steamship, wasn't it? Lusitania? I, I, I find that whole aspect of the old world narrative interesting. Um, the steam technology, um, the trains, of course, um, but also I find very interesting the, the steamships that were basically being uh, bombed into oblivion in World War One. Yeah, you know, World War I oh, really yeah. used as a technology eraser, I think. I think all the wars that we are taught, Absolutely. at least in the modern era, were all part of doing that. Mm -hmm. The co cover story, especially the Civil War in America, especially mm -hmm. there. But uh, World War One, yeah. World War Two, all of it, and. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on rail right now. Um, the steep, I think, steamships and maybe even ocean liners, mm -hmm. old world technology. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, some of the at... interior, the finish on some of those is, is incredible. Yeah. The interior finish, and that's a dead giveaway. Go ahead. You know, Sorry. and that goes back to the whole burning question: When did this happen? <laughs> you know, yeah. because big those big ocean liners. I mean, do we even have the technology to build those? You know, maybe some yeah. someone in the audience will have the answer to that question. But mm. let's, let's, so if if we keep it to the idea of the steamships being old world technology, I would say absolutely a hundred percent. Well, I'd say certainly we do not finish. Um, them in such a manner. We don't finish anything, like the fancy railings and the intricate uh, the way that they're finished. It's, we don't do that. It's not economical for one, but I, I just don't, yeah. So there's definitely something that we've lost. And that goes for the interior of the old rail cars as well. They're the Pullman rail cars are spectacular. Um, I also I just also wanted to bring up the iron sides from World War or from Civil War. That one really intrigues me as well. There's something, something weird about that. I mean, the Civil War is just a total cover story for not only the destruction of old world infrastructure, infrastructure, but also to explain the existence of like star forts and other things that were said to have been built during that time. And would you say that there's a, quite a strong emotional attachment to the Civil War in the States with the, with people in general? <laughs> Possibly in general, for sure. I mean, it's a big, huge push kind of thing. And, you know, identify uh, if you're from the north or from the south. Um, but I'm, I've done quite a bit of work on that, and I'm going to continue to do it to show that it's just a BS story. Yeah, because I, I, have, I have visions of the reenactments. You see them on the History mm -hmm. Channel, and you people get my great great grandfather fought here and then they get they're really really attached to it so much so that they're reenacting these right. battles it's, right. it's a strange phenomenon actually right and it's how this story gets continually imprinted you know yet even their question <laughs> and but it's you know it's a good example every museum um everything serves to reinforce this the whole world sphere was like an exposition which is setting the narrative um, there's a, a ship moored on the Hudson River that's supposed to be a re replica of the half moon of Henry Hudson. Okay. You know, but I, I don't even, you know, I, I look at the explorers and, you know, maybe they explored in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and then some German biographer wrote about them in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And that's the story we have about them. So I look at all of those characters really skeptically that they even existed but that's the story that's going to be promoted so they're going to put this replica of this ship yeah yeah <laughs> slap, slap the half moon on it and call it good and you know again who built those ships and i don't think it was <laughs> what the narrative tells us <laughs> no it doesn't make sense at the, at the same time everything was being built it's just that it's too obvious once you look into it there's just no no time and no resources uh, and no people, not enough people to, to make all this stuff just happen out of thin air in such a short period of time. So that's the obvious aspect to the deception, I think. And, and then you go back and look at historical pictures of gigantic buildings like in Paris and other places with nobody there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, streets are emptied except for a few small pe people compared to the size of the grand buildings that are in the picture. That's right. Yeah. So it's. Uh, and again, something that really has only entered our collective consciousness in the last couple of years, really. Like not much more than a decade, but not even for most of us. You're, you're at least a decade in, I guess, but a lot of people are you just know, touching this now. And that goes back to the importance of the internet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can't keep a lid on it. They can censor, but they can't keep up with the censorship. Um, a couple more little details from here I, thought, I think are interesting from 1916. John D. Rockefeller became the first American billionaire. Congratulations, good sir. Thanks for handing out your dimes. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We have, okay, this is what I wanted to bring up because this sort of syncs up with the uh, old world um, cover up. Uh, we have the anti art movement popping up in 1916 known as Dada. I had never heard of this mm -hmm. until yesterday. Oh. Yeah, have you heard of that at all? Yep, 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 yep. Okay. If you will, can you shed any light on that? 
<laughs> I've never heard of it, but it's like to me it screams, yeah, let's get rid of the old beauty and make this beauty now. So artists like Salvador Dali came out of that movement. Okay. You know how crazy things are right now? <laughs> yes. You can find the beginnings of this because they're exploring art forms that aren't rational. Okay. And they're saying it's tapping into the subconscious, which is actually superior to the rational mind. Oh. And um, I think it's called the Surrealist Manifesto. Uh, Breton, Andre Breton. Okay. If you want to look, look up Andre his name. Breton. I think it's Andre Breton. And it was another way of breaking down our our sensitivities to right and wrong and kind of anything goes. I mean, Dali was known for waxing his mustache up and, you know, flies catching on the the wax of the mustache. Fantastic. There's Brett. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, just doing crazy things but that this was somehow the breakdown of the rational mind was a good thing uh-huh uh-huh well we know it's not a good thing we know it's not a good thing especially no, now you're, you're easily controlled <laughs> when your rational mind is broken you're easily controlled Here's yes, surrealist men, can have period, men can have periods and get pregnant right yeah yeah so this is yeah, exactly face. Long planned, right? This is a long game. Long game here. Um, for Surrealist Manifestos. Yeah. Britain. So uh, interesting the timeline that this is happening. Um, mid, mid 19 teens. So if you put it in perspective of the erasing of the old world and the beauty of the old world and the transplanting of what we consider to be art. You and can replacing see it with absolute crap. Sure, to fracture our uh, consciousness. <laughs> our consciousness, right? exactly. Yeah. Psychic automatism is the, is in, in its pure state by which one proposes to express verbally, by means of the written word or in any other manner, the actual functioning of thought, dictated by thought in the absence of any control exercised by reason, exempt from any aesthetic or moral concern. That sounds like a do what thou wilt. Sounds a bit like a Crowley. Right. 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 So. And um, he's he's a big part of this. Yes, of course. And he he really came up in the '60s with a lot of pop culture there too, right? Which I thought interesting. Got, a, got an interview with Chad and Adam that is going to be up on on Chad's channel soon, and we're going to talk about things like that. Probably comes up big time. Let's uh, maybe we'll just share that channel too chad's channel i'll just put it in yeah, here deeper too. deeper conversations with chad and he's he's amazing he's amazing <laughs> absolutely amazing yeah let's get a let's get the viewers to have a look at this oh i'm subbed of course yeah i, I, I have seen his he's, work he's really good okay and i've done some interviews with him recently and so there's another big one that's coming up that's being edited right now so yeah. the energy, it's, it's like the second part of the energy harvesting one right there with the crane and the tree. Yeah, sure. That one. Okay, I'll put it on so my list too. It's like a part two. <laughs> cool. And, um, you know, really diving deep down that rabbit hole. Was there another and, channel? Um, Maybe this is somebody else as well. Well, Adam, Adam, it's Alchemy Spectrum. I'll just throw it up just so people can have a look. I love sharing. Yeah. I think it's, I throw your, I throw your stuff out all the time. Every second video I'm mentioning Michelle Gibson. So. <laughs> yeah. Alchemy Al Spectrum is very good. Um, his work, he's, you know, oh, people yeah. are bringing, is this yes, they're on the top. Yeah. People are really bringing in a lot of really d uh, different gifts uh -huh. um, and special abilities. Uh huh. Of um, course. And another one is um, is Stephanie McPeak Peterson. Stephanie McPeak Peterson, and her work is amazing. These are 
people I work with closely. Excellent. Happy to share. Happy to share. Let's just show so people can see and I'll yeah. put the I'll put their links also in the description. And let's uh yeah, this is a community of uh, like-minded people. I think that uh, we all need to share our ideas and everyone's got a different perspective. So yeah. check them out. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was the data we were getting into. So that's yeah. the destroying of art, really, I think. Uh, oh, also, Margaret Sanger sets up her first birth control oh, clinic. Geez. Would you look at that, <laughs> and, hey? And what's really interesting about that... Um, is that inventoriums ended around the same time mm -hmm. that was coming into existence. Well, what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, pretty easy to connect the dots when the dots are so close together. Right. <laughs> if you ask me. Yeah, exactly. And that happened in, in Brooklyn. They're saying she was promptly right. arrested for it. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. We won't get too far into Sanger, but... We, yeah, we know what she is. Well, I mean, there's definitely an anti-human agenda at work here. And, of course. You know, any any degree of red pilling, the, the further you get into it, it, it leads down some pretty dark trails. But, yeah, um, you know, again, I, I think for us to, to heal collectively and move past this, it's not for everybody, but nope. we can't just sweep it under the rug and... and um, Ignore it? And ignore it. You know, we're um, seeing a then, lot of that too right now, by the way. Sorry. So with like the orphan trains, which started around 1854, um, as far as I'm concerned, that was just large scale child trafficking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we're here to do is to shine light on that darkness. That's right. The more light that shines, the more the darkness diminishes. That's why we share what we what we do and what we know. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a relationship there. Um, all right, so we're getting all this. Uh, here we have the Lusitania, the sinking of Lusitania, 1915. We're at um, the Romanov situation um, happening in Russia. Let's see. Oh, the birth of a nation. Okay, this is interesting. D. W. Griffith's controversial film, The Birth of a Nation, portrays African Americans in negative light and glorifies the Ku Klux Klan. Definitely an agenda being set there yeah, at play right now, or attempting to put that at play right now. And, and so that's also around the origins of the film industry. Um, Which we're getting to started, as well. Started in New Jersey and moved to California. And the, you know all that represents in terms of narrative setting and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and I, I just want to talk, make a connection between the early Westerns and what you were talking about with Henry Ford. Uh -huh. um, Thomas Entz developed like an assembly line technique of production for these early Western films in the same manner that Henry Ford was mass producing automobiles, which were needed to, which were needed to replace the streetcars. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But, but what, but what they were doing, they were just hammering that whole old West, you know, motif in, in, a, in whole generations of, of young people mm -hmm. um you know that i call it the john wayne version of history mm -hmm. you know, she's pump, pumping out these these films for matinees and things like that for kids that's um uh... and then you can go take that further back around the time of this right after the civil war it started out with with dime novels dime westerns mm. And you know, mass production of these these books that were cheap, for that were targeting young boys yeah. to read about this old West, um, and then that turned into to pulp fiction, um, and then there were dime museums. I'm going to tie this back to Henry Houdini, Harry Houdini. Uh -huh. So the so the dime museums were you know basically freak shows. <laughs> yeah, interesting. You know, make it easy to go in, and you know they were like Ripley's, believe it or not, kind of things. Uh -huh. Um, and P.T. Barnum got his start in that. Uh -huh. um, circuses are another thing. <laughs> Traveling yeah. circuses. Yeah. Um, 
to really debase our consciousness, you know, at looking at these oddities and freak shows. Um, and then with Harry Houdini, a lot of his stunts were above. So direct your attention of the street goers to the above, what's going on up there. Same thing with high wire walkers and, you know, stuntmen that were on top of planes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, look, look up. Yeah, draw your <laughs> you know, attention. Don't look up, around yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. So that's all part of how we got to television and all the stuff going on. You know, the, the theme parks have been a big part of it from the beginning. Uh huh. I, I did a video on Luna Parks of the turn of the century. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all over the place too, all over the realm, not just North America. Yeah. So we're just going to have a grand old time while they do what they're doing. <laughs> keep, well, they have to keep you distracted. It's like a baby <laughs> with the rattle. <laughs> right. right. They shake the rattle for the baby. And, yeah. 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 But this, this tool, we talked about the internet a few times in this conversation, this tool can be used either for that or we can actually take take control and we can actually use it to um, to undo that, if that makes sense. Okay. You know. And, you know, probably like yourself, I know for myself, and I think probably a lot of people, I had no background in any of this when I started. I just had, I got to get this out there. Yeah. So, um, you know, started the blog and then I was going to make one video and somebody subscribed and I thought well now I've got to make videos and got the easiest video making program I could find uh -huh. and so I could make, make videos and they're still not fancy but that's not what I'm doing it they don't have to be and I think that's <laughs> the beauty the beauty of the research is the content that that draws people in it's not the flash it's not the because yeah it's not the the glitz bam boom <laughs> you know it's not it's not the visuals so much as uh or the way it's edited even sometimes i worry about that maybe i should up my editing game um things like that but i don't think that's what it's about i think it's it's the content mm -hmm. yeah one more thing in 1915 we had the first transcontinental continental telephone call thank you alexander graham bell for that <laughs> the setting of the new communications narrative we're seeing unfold here right. as well as we trace this down through time 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, yada, yada, yada. What can you really believe? Oh, Charlie Chaplin. Let's see. 24-year-old first appeared in movie theaters. Charlie Chaplin. In this year, 1914. Also, Shackleton, Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So again, we have those polar navigations really being pushed in our consciousness. Interesting, I think. And then the Panama Canal gets a bit of a mention. We have a, a volcanic eruption in Japan. Sakurajima, Sakurajima. Um, supposedly most powerful eruption of the 20th century in Japan, 1914. And I know you've done some good research, you know, on what we think of as natural disasters and what are we really looking at um, with those, you know, because what can you really believe and trust? Is it the shifting of the crust of the of the orange, or what's going well, on? Well, let's just say with with some of those hurricanes, they hit the exact same location more than one time <laughs> over a long period of time. What are what are the odds? Yeah. Or or you'll see, um, you know, the the hurricane like stalling over somewhere. Or you'll see a, a loopy kind of pattern in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you see a turn on a turn on a dime and go 90 degrees in a different direction. Sometimes. And then, and then you have a cycle in the lifespan of a hurricane called explosive cyclogenesis. <laughs> oh, never heard of that. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to look it up now. Ex it's too, it's too, explosive it's... cyclogenesis. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll check it out on the recording. I'll do some deep research on it. 1913. Let, let's keep going. Or, or, right. or, or, uh, eye wall replacement. <laughs> That's eye, eye wall, eye replacement. wall replacement. Hurricane eye wall replacement. <laughs> yes. Yes. What? Yes. All right, I'm gonna look at it. Yes, up. sir. <laughs> Never heard of that. Thank you. 
high wall cycles, naturally occur intense tropical cyclones. <laughs> what? It's like the rebuilding of the eye wall. <laughs> Like the strengthening, the reinforcing of, of a hurricane. Island. That's so strange. What? I think it's a pretty good clue. <laughs> Never heard of it. I'm glad we could bring it to uh, the attention of, of uh, myself and the viewers for sure. Um, something worth a, a deeper dive. Wow. The new outer eye wall slowly moves <laughs> inward, robs the original inner eye wall of its needed moisture and angular momentum. Thievery. <laughs> okay all right interesting i learned this is this is never never heard of this before so that's interesting <laughs> oh man oh, model t we're gonna with the henry ford really popping up in the early 19th century or 1900s really like a huge part of the and we know henry ford's history if you've done any bit of research on henry ford we know that uh um not the not the nicest person, I think. From if you dig a little bit, doesn't he have uh, supposed racist undertones with a lot of his uh, ties with the Nazis and all that type of yeah, stuff? Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. I think it's all sort of in there. I'll, I'll leave it alone for now. Um, I'm sure someone in yeah. the comments will throw it in there. So they had to bring in mass-produced automobiles to replace the. Um, electric street cars that were all over the earth yeah through neighborhoods and everything yeah. that were you know part of the uh, energy grid system and efficient and you know non-polluting <laughs> well you know, replace replace them with gasoline powered vehicles that are polluting and you know bring in the insurance and bring in the the death from car accidents and they, weren't they, they had to do all that <laughs> they're originally meant to be pulled by horses right Right. <laughs> and that was starting around 18, early 1850s was, so I, I look at it like they were, they got the um, streetcars up and running yeah. with the mules and then they um, electrified them sometime around this 1870s and then they took them out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. So by the time they got this whole replacement going, with the automobile and trucks and so forth, they they retired the um, the streetcar systems. In most cases, completely took them out. Yeah. Removed the rails and everything, and they left them in a few major cities. Also, but they erased, were everywhere. Erased almost all evidence that they were in a lot of these locations as well. Right. right. And then they had eight, they had streetcars called interurbans, where they would go between cities as well, and they uh, took that system out. Interesting. I haven't done a lot of research on the interurbans. That's interesting. Yeah. It sounds like a kind of a romantic version of travel. You can imagine hopping on the streetcar, yeah. going to the market. And, you know, it would have been, yeah. You know, I tell people I'd like to have a time machine and go back for a day and just see what this civilization was like. I think it was fun. I think it was a fun, harmonious civilization, and oh, nothing like what we've been told. If you, know, if you people just... were in harmony, and re people were in harmony and resonance together. You look at the amount of uh, opera houses and theaters, um, you know, so obviously um, entertainment, the arts, not entertainment, but the arts, I think, but more so. Like it is entertainment, but it's the arts. It's almost like uh, it had to have been a big part of uh, the old world culture. You know? you know, and even with cathedrals and other buildings, but let's look at cathedrals um, as, you know, people weren't going to worship listening to a preacher. They were in there for something else yeah because you have organs and bells and um the the shapes of the cathedral windows like the rose windows and um you know certain kind of is actually this form the rose windows are like solfeggio frequency patterns uh -huh. and then uh, and then the more um there's windows that are like so like the rose windows in the middle let's look at that second floor there here and then to either side, the shapes, there's two windows on either side. That's that's like an antenna. It's it's like, it has to do with sound. Uh -huh. And and then the organs are typically right up against these windows, the like the rosette window. Yeah. And and so these these healing tones were going out and and these buildings were facing each other. So it was like a perfectly, in, in sacred geometry. So it was like a perfectly, you know, aligned 
system. And mm -hmm. personally, I believe that Earth is such a big prize because I think all of these frequencies that were being generated for positive purposes were going out. With the organ and the bells and the windows, I think we're sending healing frequencies out not only to the Earth and the Earth grid, but also to the universe because there's bell towers that just, you know, <laughs> are yeah. so very high and, and they're in alignment with each other too. Mm -hmm. So I just, uh, I just think Earth was like Grand Central of the universe. Really? That's and interesting. And holding it in balance. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little about why, why they get to have this uh, period of time of control. What's your, what do you, what's your take on that? As far as a God, you know, well, I absolutely believe in source creator, you know, we just didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> we're not an accident and, came out of the, and we're not an accident. And I think we're much, much, much closer to the creator than what we've been told like much. <laughs> And that's why we're such a big prize and Earth is a big prize because we have a connection with the Creator um, that, you know, with our soul and our, our DNA and, you know, who we really are and how powerful we, we really are, um, that these parasites need that energy. And so, um, you know, they put this whole fabricated system in you know taught us to think of ourselves as sinful creatures um you know believing in something outside of ourselves and um, believe me if it's written down it can be tampered with <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know even even if it wasn't that way to begin with you know they didn't start from scratch now you, you, um, you bring that up and I, I wanted you to mention would you get into the Scaliger you know the whole concept of what that okay. I, I can talk about it. Um, let me talk a little bit about my timeline research. Okay. And then I'll talk yeah, about Gallagher. Okay. Do your thing. So, shortly after I started doing my own research, I, I this thought came into my mind of this, this time loop between 1492 and 1942, which is a 450-year period. And then refining it further, the midpoint year is 1717, with 20, 225 years on either side. And if you think of a, you know, figure eight, um, that's kind of how I came on that idea. Yeah. And I'm also, I also tied it to the earth grids, um, ley lines, great dragon lines. Yeah. And then I started researching history um, from 1492 on it and around 1717 the midpoint year there were a lot of anomalies as well including the founding of the premier lodge of london freemason lodge um, which was the same year that they adopted the analuchus calendar um, which is which is the masonic calendar okay analuchus <laughs> lucha yeah lucha yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so other things happened around that same time that was when the the georgian kings king george the first that line came in from hanover and replaced the stuart line which is significant and i've done a lot yeah. of research on that as well so they were replacing the original royal houses of europe um with this obscure ducal line from Germany, the, the um, House of Saxe Coburg of and Gotha, uh, which started out as Duke Francis of Saxe Coburg Saalfeld, but he was a progenitor of this line. Uh, Mayor Amschel Rothschild came in in 1744, Adam Weishaupt came in in 1748, and Duke Francis came in in 1750. And, uh. John Rockefeller came in around 1830. So I believe these are the these are souls that are incarnating, um, and I seriously believe that the Philadelphia experiment went back and created this rip in the fabric of space-time. Interesting. Um, and 
There was something called the Great Frost of Ireland that happened between 1740 and 1741. And I think that experiment caused that to happen. And I, I have done some intense research on this. I'm, I can back it up. <laughs> I found physical evidence for it. Yeah. And um, I really think that's what happened. And I really have developed a, some thoughts along that line. I, I hope you can see the, the next interview with Chad and Adam because we really go deep into that. I'll be all over it. I have actually <laughs> looked a lot into your, your timeline um, theory and it's a, it's a really good backbone for understanding that this could happen here and uh, how it may have transpired. So I think it's really important to share that information. You know, for... So between 1492 and, 19, and 1942, there's nine 50-year periods of time. And there were major events that were initiated during the 40, 41, and 42, and the 90, 91, 92 in the timeline. So I'm gonna call those anchors, anchor points of this okay. new timeline. Yeah. And again, I, like I said before, I, I think at a certain point in time it's it's fabricated and then at a certain point in time it's history with the controllers written into it. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, that's one aspect of it. Within that period of time, so I mentioned the 50-year time periods, I believe there's 20-year time periods. And I've done the most research in the 19th century. So the 19... The, 19, I'm sorry, 1810, 1830, 1850, 1870, 1890. There's a lot of new activity coming in. So 1810-ish, okay. you've got the War of 1812, you've got the New Madrid earthquake. Yeah. Which has some really shady stories around it. Yeah. And um, 1830, uh, you've got uh, businesses being set up, um, German immigrants coming over, uh, a lot of German influence during this time, German Jewish influence, yeah. um, creation of department stores, um, livestock butcher butchering, lumber industry. Uh -huh. um, you know, they're they're. It's it's an anti-life culture, so they start to package things, cut down trees, kill animals. You know, create jobs where you have to get paid, but not well. Yeah. You know, keeping you subservient to the system while they're making tons of money. Yeah. Um, 1850, you have a lot of new activity coming in and you have, uh, like I mentioned, the Crystal Palace exhibition or exposition uh -huh. in 1851. Um, lots of new stuff going on around that. 1870, uh, you have a lot of stuff. Uh, you've got the, you know, U.S. Corp. <laughs> Yeah, Inc. Uh, USA Inc. Um, you know, in India, you've got, um, I want to say it was the Criminal Tribes Act that year. Anyway, there's a lot going on in India with the transfer of power from the British East India Company to Queen Victoria. Uh -huh. And then uh, there's something called the Criminal Tribes Act where they oppressed the original ruling families by criminalizing them. Interesting. Um, 1890, there's a lot of new stuff going on, a lot of building uh, architectural stuff happening during that time. I mean, you've got yeah. it kind of throughout, buildings attributed, whatever, but there's a lot of activity around those years. And so I, I think it's just part of the way they structured this, this new timeline that they superimposed over the original civilization to yeah. explain how everything came into existence. Um, I absolutely believe that the Freemasons were a big part of this. Um, Buffalo Bill Cody was a Freemason. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of Freemasons. <laughs> they come Can out I and you start looking into it. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question as it relates to the hijacking of the uh, royal houses. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Halesii Selassie. In Theo Ethiopia, mm -hmm. I know Bob mm -hmm. Marley was was really big on, on on him. And is that was that the ending of that old line? Do you think, or is that? Y yeah, absolutely. That was one. That was probably the most recent example mm. of the House of Solomon. Which is interesting. Well, why Bob Solomonic line? 
if, if you if you get into Bob Marley's uh, music, it really resonates with uh, what's happened here, on, you know, on a, on a con subconscious or a consciousness level. But it's interesting that he was so um, fascinated with that individual. I just I felt like I needed to bring it up because it's been in the back of my mind. Um, right, with... and and I believe that um, the House of Stewart was Solomonic also. Probably other houses, the, the original houses, but um, but for sure, and, and and they stole the legacy. The, the new royal stole that legacy. Okay, I know we don't have to go too deep into it, but I have another question. Do you think the House of Stewart is still looking to regain control? We don't have to go too far into it, but you know, I I don't know, but I did see something recently that was was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know that, um, or maybe you don't know, but I I didn't really get into it until I saw a Twitter post, but. Um, Donald Trump's mother was from one of the islands, the Scottish yeah. islands. Sure, yeah. We had a recent coronation. We had and that I'm, recent just gonna, coronation. I'm just going to leave it there. Because <laughs> yeah. we're going to get eaten alive in the comments if we go too far down this road, right? Right, right. But I thought I that was interesting. <laughs> and I would say you and I resonate um, quite, quite well <laughs> on that point as well. But it so. is a fact that his mother was, was Scottish from yeah. the Isles. And if you look up the Lord of the Isles, um there's again a lot of obfuscation around that um but I, I think it's very important because one of the titles of the the current british monarch um is lord of the isles oh the the one who was just crowned is that who you're talking the, about you know it's back to a certain time in in history so it might have been the union of the crowns um, oh, I see. but the but the lord of the isles um, okay. And again, it's it's you have to read between the lines and everything. <laughs> of course, of course. But right, we're standing back and we're getting in a you know, especially since we're talking about one of the titles of the British monarch now. I think it's um, it's interesting to look at. Well, we could even look, we could get into the significance of um, the previous monarch. Yeah, well, there's the funeral that happened in September <laughs> and I'm sure you know the time distance between the her funeral right. and the coronation of <laughs> Sir Charles King Charles right. um, six months six weeks six months <laughs> come on guys it's too obvious it's too obvious yeah it's I I <laughs> they came in through an obscure duple line and took over all the royal houses of Europe, particularly through Victoria and Albert, who were first cousins. They, they belonged to the same house of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha. They changed the name on July 17th of 1917 to Windsor. So that was during World War, World War I. They said it was because of anti-German sentiment, but you know, also to you know, throw dust in everybody's eyes. Oh, that's not who we are. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's well, usurpers, right? Usurpers. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. No question about it. F R A U D S S. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's never been more obvious, and they've never been more loathed than now in this period of time by the by the general public. I think the spell is is breaking, and it was a spell, and has been a spell, and it is most certainly breaking. I think. Yeah. And one thing that that supports the whole. Um, uh, Donald Trump's mother thing is that on a visit to the Queen, he walked in front of her. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you just don't do that. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting. Also interesting that he was over there when the coronation occurred. Right. So there's some, right. some strange, you know. There's something going you gotta on read, there. You got to read between the lines for sure. Yeah. Um, another subject I want to touch on with you, um, if you have a bit of time. Um, it gets into what some people will call meltology or so i've researched a lot of um, the cataclysm catastrophism versus um, uniformitarianism and how the uniformitarianism school of thought was pushed on us by the royal societies darwin's like sir charles lyell a lot of the old royal society types of the late 17 and early 18 early to mid 1800s right into the 1900s um, they're trying to obscure evidence of a catastrophe that, that happened here. 
how do you feel about that? If you don't, if you want to get into that, <laughs> we get too much. Yes. <laughs> so again, with the internet, um, I didn't know anything about the mud flood until after I started making videos, doing my own research and blogging. Uh, somebody connected me with somebody that was in doing mud flood research, uh -huh. and when I when I looked at it, it's like we're looking all at the same buildings, all looking at the same buildings, uh -huh. and and then that became a pretty central part of what I believe took place um i don't know if it happened all at once i don't know if it happened you know in with a few years and different you know, separate incidents um but something happened and it could have been all at once and i'm kind of cycling back around to that but yeah and i believe the, the sinking of atlantis took place much much more recently than what we've been told yeah and, and so um something happened that's being covered up and if you look at historic pictures of places uh just type in mud flood as a search term yeah you know and you'll see buildings being dug out that have a lot more going on underneath the surface um and then they paved the road <laughs> yeah you know and and so you've got a slant in front of the building and then you've got windows you know like a full window up at the top and a partial window down at the bottom <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so clearly something happened, and and I think you know when we talk about what the narrative tells us, I'm more inclined to believe that they were, you know, reclaiming everything during the same years that they said they were building it. Mm -hmm. You know, they were making it usable again. They had to have sure. the infrastructure to restart their their new civilization. Yeah. Yeah, and then it is—it's difficult to say whether it all happened at once, or if there was a series, or if it was all, um, yeah, it was a series yeah. of cat cataclysms. It, this is very it, interesting. It, but based on my research, I believe there was a civilization that went back to ancient times to relatively modern times. I—I uh -huh. I don't believe in multiple resets over a long period of time because I do not see how such a beautiful integrated civilization could have come about if there was constantly resets happening it's just it's all integrated it's, it's all integrated but i do believe in one massive reset absolutely uh -huh. massive they got into everything sure. they got into yeah. language they got into religion um they got into everything imaginable yeah and what, and what we're seeing is when we look at the beauty of these art the architecture um you would need a long time you need more of a timeline of existence to even even so our our, our lifetimes what is 70 80 year lifetimes they were we're told on average it's not enough time for us to appreciate longevity uh, um, and to put enough uh um in emphasis into um beauty like the way that a lot of these old buildings are structured um, you know what i mean it, it implies a longer lifespan i guess is what i'm trying to get at and they're lined so, up to, to the start to the heavens on celestial yeah. events you know equinoxes and solstices yeah. all over the earth um yeah. you know archways have solar and lunar alignments um you know everything's lining up perfectly you've got like the temple at angkor wat with the solstice i believe it's yeah. see their solstice or equinox alignment where it just rolls yeah. up the side <laughs> you know yeah. that's the very tory it's like it's all over the place that just didn't happen randomly no, and I've seen your work on some of the lighthouses as well, and just the way that a lot of them line up, and it's it's really interesting. So uh, my theory, if I, if I could share a bit of that with you, because <laughs> I, I get into this whole what you might call meltology, or the, mm -hmm. this some of a large part of our realm was much more devastated than other parts. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right, and then that's how they now they've distorted our historical timeline to believe that what we're looking at in places like Turkey and Egypt. Mm -hmm. Um, are from way further, much further back in time, thousands of years, rather than all being a part of that civilization that was existed here. Right. Well, you look at some of these. Uh, you know, that's a good example. Um, you know, where it's like it's like built into the. <laughs> it's not possible to the, carve that out. Rock. It's, ab <laughs> it's absolutely not possible to carve that out. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah I, I had a thought and it, it departed. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I, I oh, did want well, to approach the subject. Go ahead. Well, well, you look at the desert areas in the western 
you know, North America. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, yep. even on down, like, on the western coast of South America. Uh-huh. You know, so, you, you know, you've got Western Canada, you've got Western United States, where it's just, like, <laughs> desert, you know, yeah. on down. And then you've got deserts all over the earth, and, the, you know, the Sahara. And, you know, you look at the Sahara on Google Earth, and it looks like a, a gigantic mudslide especially on on the western side Mauritania in that area you know so it's like something big happened so well, we also have maps right mm-hmm. showing the Sahara inhabited right or showing cities right so you know let's say that you know I've, I've got some ideas now on the thinking of Atlantis that are a little bit more refined um, but was there some kind of directed energy weapon attack going on either at the same time or a different time? Because, you know, it's clear, especially you know, I, I, living in Arizona, I mean, I see it all over the place. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then there's the whole subject of giant trees, which has come, you know, blaring into my consciousness lately. And I'm really, I'm <laughs> seeing that too. <laughs> I was thinking of that recently, and like, <laughs> what if the tree, the trees we have now, were like a massive, like a massive burst of seeding and the destruction of, of, of maybe giant trees, you know? And you have Some... it spread across the realm in forests. So, yeah, go ahead. Something happened, you know, and the tree yeah. story is much more important than. But what most we know. of most of our uh, forests aren't much more than three, four hundred years old, as far as we can tell, as well, which sinks nicely with uh, some of this research you know and a lot of places go ahead you've got some old growth forests in your part of the world right they're on the coast they're telling us they go up to about eight eight hundred years or so but uh, definitely inland um, 400 uh, an old tree is 200 years old really two two, through two to 250 years old is an old tree in the inland regions of Canada so coastal, for some reason, has a different uh, different storyline. So I don't know exactly what to say about that there, but it's uh, mm-hmm. it's definitely all sorts of things there's, to consider. There's patches, <laughs> like in California. Yeah. Woods. Well, wonder if there was any ability to preserve areas as well. Um, if there was a cataclysm and if it was induced by parasites. Uh, um potentially i mean how do you get rid of a giant tree so that's like you know big question that comes up but as far as the 1850s again and all the logging that was going on in places like california um you know they the top they, they got rid of a lot of big trees so it could have been a combination of things for sure. yeah yeah, so it's definitely strange goings on, and it's a uh, really fun research to. Uh, I, I always say this: you never get bored once you open yourself up to this stuff. No. There's, there's so much stuff. information. <laughs> I, I can't keep up with it. No, no, it's not possible. That's why we need each other to sort of to reach out and uh, you know, add our it, ideas. You know, and there's also the importance of the grid lines, the ley lines, and super yeah. geometry because this wall. It's all connected to that, and not just on the Earth, but celestial grid lines as well. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the Earth was completely connected, and you know who knows now <laughs> with all the damage that's been done and all the um, infrastructure that's been destroyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think of of uh, ideas like Stonehenge possibly being? Um, uh, faked? You know, I, I, I don't know. I can tell you that there is a completely intact Stonehenge in Washington State. Oh, really? Or It's called the Mary Hill Stonehenge. That's very interesting. And there's a there's a garbage story that goes along with it, but it's, oh, yeah. it's got, you know, alignments with the Milky Way and um, search for Mary Hill Stonehenge. Mary Hill Stonehenge. I believe it's on one side or the other, the Columbia River, and Washington State's on one side and Oregon's on the other side. 
So strange. I just did a video. If you look at pictures, <laughs> yeah. If you look at pictures of this place at night, you you know see the Milky Way overhead and the uh -huh. you know the sun coming up. So the story is that this was a war memorial. It was mm. built in 1915. World War One is well somewhere in there it's by Sam Hill. Uh, no oh, here, dedicated 1918. 1918, yeah. so World War One, somewhere in there. That's uh, the as, you, as you would do, why, why wouldn't you make it look like a... Now they're saying built <laughs> 1918 to 1929. Oh, man. Replica. It looks, it's a replica. At least it took them a while. I mean, sometimes it's like the same year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's... Yeah, huge part of their narrative, really. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, Sam Hill, that's right. In the wintertime. <laughs> Yeah, love. I love working outdoors in the winter. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Get a lot uh, done. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, it's just interesting. I've never heard of this place. It's, what it is amazing how how much there is. How much there is. It's just it's mind blowing. You know, you know it's like who whoever was writing the narrative said, okay, we'll just put this in here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter what was going on. You know, wars and time of year. <laughs> like, you no, know, we're just gonna stick this right here. <laughs> <laughs> this architect designed it this company built it <laughs> yeah it's and it's and it's really it's uh the layers are being peeled back i just had a good conversation <laughs> with a, a a friend of mine matthew an architect from seattle and uh we kind of blew the lid off h h richardson yeah the Henry romanesque richardson. style mm -hmm. one, one of the geniuses <laughs> right it's it's a silly story it's and it's it's um I find it offensive. I'm offended. It offends my sensibilities. A lot of but what can, they try to tell us. You can put Frank Lloyd Wright in the same category um, and his mentor. There's like three of them Sullivan. that are like the triumvirate of, yeah, Sullivan, the triumvirate yeah. of architects. We're going to take a look and, at that with them as well. You yeah. know, and Frank Lloyd Wright is like such an icon. <laughs> it's like a blasphemy. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. It's like a religion. He's right up there, Roebling and the Brooklyn what? Bridge. Um, a, a yeah. John Augustus Roebling. Yeah, I um, never heard about Roebling. Huh. He, he was the, arch, the civil engineer that built the Brooklyn Bridge or behind the Brooklyn Bridge. Civil engineer, eh? Interesting because we, we, we noticed that the engineers don't seem to get much credit. It seems to always be architects. Engineers and builders are like, don't matter. As far as the historical narrative goes, but architects get all the glory. All right, I'll share a Roblin here, too. John Augustus Roblin. So he he was said to have built the the Roblin Bridge in Cincinnati, which is clearly old world, and you know you can find examples of the bridges that look goes, like the the Brooklyn Bridge all over the earth too. He goes way back in the narrative too. 1806, born. 1869. Yeah. Or civil war apparently died in, this, in that time period and then they usually have a projects attribution this is always fun to go through if they're going to show us a lot of times they won't show well what's amazing is the detail that they put into these cover stories yeah, <laughs> this, yeah. It, and you know the same thing with trains and other infrastructure it's like there's this whole big backstory with all kinds of little teeny tiny details <laughs> well, there seems to be a real time, um, a real time effort, like in real time, to beef up these backstories. I've noticed it in my searches, even compared to a couple of years ago, um, and getting more construction photos than you would have found two years ago. Um, very bad construction photos. Here's one example. Let me just show you. Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City. Yep. You're familiar yep. with. Yeah. Yep. So I used to search this a couple of years ago as I, was, as I was checking out your stuff uh, and just getting into this field of research. Um, and I would do a search just like I'm doing right now. And what I would, what I end up getting is a lot of uh, construction photos. Actually, I'm not seeing them now. Here, I actually put Chateau Frontenac construction. I just feel like that there's an active effort going on. Here we go. So they're giving us a lot more Photoshop 
<laughs> They're giving us a lot more. Um, so, so anyone who's new looking into this will say, okay, well, look, I just typed in construction photos, and they've got hundreds of them now. It's like, well, that didn't right. exist two years ago. Where were they two years ago? And same thing with um, World Spheres, construction photos yeah. of the World Spheres. Yeah. And, you know, now that, that that's been blown up, blown up, so people are onto that. Um, and then the St. Louis Arch. I don't think it was built when we're told it was built by any means. <laughs> but you've got construction photos out there. So, you know, it just confuses, you know, people that are looking into this that are more inclined to accept the his history and oh here's mm -hmm. proof but yeah i mean there's a perfect alignment with that <laughs> yeah. building which i think is an old courthouse with, with the that. arch and then you you know you find other alignments in st louis like that so the new world statue that's <laughs> terrible they couldn't even get the couldn't get any of this right the proportions are off that's not old world but that is back there yeah this is a good actually a good visual and you know old world building brutalist architecture possibly modified because they do modify old world structures um, and square off the roofs take away the decoration and call it uh, you know, that happens a lot so so another one I, I think it's just look up quartz building in st louis real quick quartz or quartz let's type in quartz building and see what comes up st louis yeah Quartz or quartz, like the rock? This one? Yes. So click on the top left real quick. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> that uh -huh. building was said to have been modeled after the mausoleum of Holocarnassus, which you find in New York, you know, several building designs. And I want to say that's a Depression era building. Let's have a look. We'll just, there's uh, also see two what sphinxes. Say. There's also two sphinxes at the top. As you do, of course. <laughs> 1928. Oh, completed 1930. Right in the middle of the crash. Right in the middle of the stock market crash. St. Louis is an amazing city. Amazing. So you, you've got plenty of examples of the mausoleum of hill carnassus running around <laughs> like i said you've got two sphinxes up at the top up there that were attributed oh to something yeah else. i can't believe i haven't seen this <laughs> that's amazing you know michelle i've looked at st louis multiple times for, and I've, i don't think i've seen this building which is strange as well very strange that i could do a search and not come up with a building like this Oh, a strange aspect of the research as well. Oh, I love the columns, the upper columns. Right? And of course, wow, this is amazing. All built during the Depression. Yeah. So so that kind of goes back to once you start looking at the narrative, it just falls completely. It down. does. It has no legs to stand on, really. Yeah. It's relying on, on the deception and the lack of willingness and care for us to look. Right. I think. And our distractions. our distractions, so we don't ask questions. Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, I think maybe we can start to wrap it up. I can put a bow on it. Um, unless right. you, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. We did, and I really wanted to, and I was so excited to have this conversation, and I wanted to like, I had a list of all these things I wanted to talk to you about, but I hope we can talk again, and maybe we can narrow our focus or or just chat like this again if you're up for it. <laughs> My head is just filled with all of this obscure information. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I had a I had a good starting point. I had a good grounding when I started. It was like I I had the, the more civilization, I had sacred geometry, I had my data points, I knew what I was looking at, I knew what to look for. And um, I had a complete framework. And that's what my, my very first video I ever made was about, was my framework. And I've gone places I never even imagined, and so much deeper than I could have seen when I started. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, and, I'm happy to be here on the journey, and I, I want to say thank you for, for, like I said, the work you've done. It's a major inspiration, and it's a, it's a good starting point for people who are just getting into this. 
is to get into your work. So I encourage people to check out, um, really d dive deep into the, into the work that you've done and come up with an right. understanding. Of you know, and it just keeps building and building, but I, I've, I've got a lot of my earlier videos that my work is based on um, that, that don't have the views that I have now, but it, it was seminal in developing this. Mm -hmm. Some of the early stuff. Some okay. of the earlier stuff, and especially this the circle alignments, the linear yeah. alignments, because that's how I got here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Excellent. That's worth a look. There's there's something to it that's beyond random. Yeah. So yeah. so I'm looking at linear alignments of cities in the United States, and they're they're all county seats for the most part. Isn't that one funny? or two exceptions? And I looked at four different alignments, and they were all county seats. Yeah. With maybe one exception. Yeah. So yeah. It's or definitely or capitals or state capitals. They all yeah, they had the court, was... the capital buildings and the big fancy courthouses and that kind of thing. So it's like it those was... places were made <laughs> important places. Yeah. There's much more to it than just random civilization springing out of the out of the mud, isn't there? Yeah. Maybe we can next time we can get into the uh, the grid and the canals and the terraforming, if you'd like. Sure. Uh, and also eclipse paths. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. I'll do some research on those areas, and then, and then uh, maybe we can have another conversation sometime later in the summer, whenever you feel like it. I have a video okay. called the Seven Seven Sailor Solar Eclipse. Um, so the 2017 total eclipse goes in one direction from Salem, Oregon, on down through the country. And yeah. then the 2024 that's coming next year comes from the opposite direction, and they both cross at Carbondale, and Carbondale, Car just south of Carbondale, Illinois. <laughs> really? That's interesting. Is it beyond random? Carbondale. I'm gonna put that in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna look up that area. We heard of it. And there's and there's nine Salem's on that one. Oh, just nine. <laughs> and there might have been more. You know, but most yeah. of these places, you know, when you go looking at the Salem's, there's not there's some places that are still there but a lot of places aren't there anymore of course yeah when you get into the whole mud flood and what's been erased and yeah what, what isn't there anymore it's interesting okay well I, I thank you for joining me here this morning yeah. and uh, i look forward to, to us doing it again that would be great just send me an email anytime right on all right thanks a lot